for all our listeners, and thank you for tuning in to the Beats Radio Research, a podcast streamed from an active lab at the University of Ottawa Heart Institute. My name is Moa Kalaf, and I am a postdoctoral research fellow here at the university, and I'll be your host on today's episode. Our goal here at Beats Research Radio is to communicate science to the community. Uh, we hope that by doing this, we are able to engage listeners from all different backgrounds about how research advancements make their way from the lab to the bench and to the market and clinics. Before we get going today, I'd like to thank the University of Ottawa Heart Institute, eLife, the Canadian Biomaterials Ottawa Student Chapter, the Beats Research Lab, and uh, all the uh, departments that are involved in the production of, uh, of this uh, podcast. And everybody that supports, uh, supports the Beats Research Radio. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. And you can also uh, visit our podcast on uh, many of the available, um, available platforms, such as Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and more. Here today with me is Dr. Juan Cesar Schiano, a, uh, a senior researcher at the University of, of Ottawa, uh, the head of the, uh, of the photo, uh, uh, photochemistry uh, research program. Uh, thank, you, thank you for coming, Dr. Schiano. You're welcome. Pleasure to be here. Uh, it is an honor to have somebody of, of the highest, uh, highest uh, uh, accomplishments in the field, the father of uh, the uh, photochemistry uh, that, we have, uh, that we have here in the, in the university and globally. So thank you for that. Um, our first question, I guess, so the, in the, the effort, uh, one of the efforts for having this program, this, this podcast, is to communicate science and to, to show guidance to the early career scientists that uh, are involved uh, in either education or early professional career. So I think one of the first questions that I'd like to ask you is, um, how was your experience as an early academic and an early career professional? Well, my, my early experience involved a lot of travel and a lot of moving. I, I was born in Argentina. I did my undergraduate in Argentina. I did my PhD in Chile. I followed with uh, two years in the UK in University College London as a postdoc. I went back to South America to both Chile and Argentina for a period of a couple of years. And eventually at the end of 74, came back, came to Canada, uh, stayed in Canada for uh, a year and a half. And then the US where I was at the the radiation laboratory, laboratory at the University of Notre Dame, uh, a facility of the uh, Department of Energy. This is uh, this is seventy six uh, for three years, uh, and it was the period in which uh, uh, radiation radiation laboratories and so on were switching from uh, ionizing radiation to to solar. Uh, a part a, a consequence of uh, the 1973 oil embargo that pushed many countries, in particularly the U.S., to seek opportunities in solar energy. So after three years, I returned to Canada, and that's that's 40 years ago. And I've been in Canada since that time in, in Ottawa, first at the National Research Council, uh, doing some teaching at Ottawa U as a part-time and for the last uh, nearly 30 years now, 29, at Ottawa U, and uh, very happy to, to have been able to, to promote photochemistry from uh, very early uh, to today, where photochemistry has become uh, a tool for many of my colleagues, uh, my colleagues that they, where photochemistry was a, a rare technique, a rare methodology to use, now it has become a very common one with uh, things like photoredox catalysis and other uh, approaches to synthesis. So anyway, uh, a lot of moving, enough to have four children born in four different countries. So That is amazing. Yeah. And, that is, and that is key to uh, what scientists around the world uh, experience is the fact that 
uh, being able to be educated from multiple different conduits, from multiple different um, uh, sources, is what uh, is I think extremely important and under and under uh, uh, undervalued in terms of uh, the ability for a scientist to compile a, a level of expertise. Now I have two follow-up questions to okay. you there. Uh, the first is how how would you describe the difficulty in terms of uh, navigating uh, your early career research when you had when you were able to um, basically move from South America to Europe to North America are there any specific um, ideas uh, to share with young scientists in terms of what it means to have this very variable uh, 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 path towards uh, your career um, I was very fortunate because um in spite of all this moving around and so on and, and, and dragging the family around the world with, with all of these uh, stages, uh, I always had a, a champion, uh, a, somebody who uh, helped me uh, with my career at the, in Chile with uh, Professor Eduardo Lisi, the same one that supervised uh, Dr. Alarcón's uh, PhD thesis. So we are we're only 39 years apart in terms of our graduation from the PhD with the same supervisor. Um, and then in England, having somebody who actually helped me uh, as a postdoc um, do some independent research. And he was just fine with, with you know, my doing my postdoc sort of uh, with him, with Alwyn Davis, and at the same time doing some uh, computational chemistry at the time. This is 1970-72. Um, and in, in a, I had an opportunity to come to Canada for a short time uh, in, in 1974. Uh, it became a, a longer time, and, and except for, uh, for, for the three years in the U.S., I mean, that short visit to Canada uh, was started 45 years ago. So, um, and I had both at NRC initially here in, in Ottawa, at the University of Ottawa, people who um, who were my champions, who really helped me get started, supported me, and things like that. So th that is an element of a, of, a, of of seeing your science through, seeing your science communicated, and so on, um, and an element of luck because not always uh, your science is necessarily recognized by by people who can actually promote your career. So. A little bit of both, uh, hard work, a little bit of luck, and and, and Cer so. certainly hard work is is uh, key in in early career. And uh, like you were mentioning there, mentorship, yes. mentorship, having having the guidance and having the champions, yes, uh, is is a, a key component to uh, to a successful uh, uh, career infrastructure from the very beginning. And uh, to that, I would ask you then from from what you have experienced and uh, you know throughout the world what would be some of the key points that you as a mentor now to so many uh, to so many young young scientists what are some of the um, um, you know uh, important uh, i would say tips uh, that you would uh, give uh, the, uh, the young men uh, you frequently do things in terms of reference and advice and things like that to uh, to young scientists, to people starting their career, um, and you get thanked for it, okay? And I always tell them, don't thank me. Do it for somebody else later on. Uh, that works, okay? The, the sort of a pay, pay forward, in a sense. The pay uh, yeah. forward, yeah. And, and so, um, and, and usually that gets recognized and, you know, Somebody else will get, get help down the line and so on. So we all produce uh, papers, uh, occasionally patents and things like that. The best thing we produce is people with knowledge. Okay. That, yeah. that, that is definitely yeah. true. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the key to, to, to a lasting legacy is the branch that, yeah. that carries Absolutely. forward. So. And, and uh, uh, you, you are definitely someone that we all look up to in terms of how you are able to Provide and and uh, and mentor us, including our own uh, faculty over here. Dr. Emilio Alarcon uh, sees you as a 
as a, a figure that is extremely important in in uh, in, in the process uh, that 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 he has gone through, and uh, uh, that that is for sure the case. Um, I would I would I would even uh, want to uh, examine this further by asking you. Um, uh, do you do you ever feel that uh, there are some um, ways that uh, y do you do you feel that it is how or the way I would ask it here is how how would global and international um, um, research uh, and and exposure to uh, a, a multi angled uh, um, um, Career development uh, differ from maybe a more localized uh, environment, and do you seek um, um, to to have uh, folks from around the world come into your lab? And what kind of advantages do you think that can give? Um, well, science is global, uh, so if if I look at my own group at the present time, I have people from Canada, from Argentina. Those are relatively large part of the group, but I have people from Chile, from Brazil, from Syria, from Lebanon, from China, uh, from Italy, from Germany. So uh, it is a very global thing, actually, and I think we all learn from, uh, from each other. We all come from different backgrounds, uh, and, and these days that we hear so much about in inclusivity and diversity and so on, uh, the people who are in a group which is uh, multinational uh, and, and diverse in many ways, diverse in, in gender, diverse in, in culture, diverse in religion, uh, learn to accept this and to, I think it makes for uh, a better better country, actually. A compassionate world. Yeah. yeah. A compassionate yeah, world. Absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and science definitely benefits from the fact that uh, it is it is a, a global currency, and everybody everybody that is interested in pursuing knowledge um, uh, becomes yeah. a part of a single family. The, the the international students, I would say, looking at the last whatever thirty years or something like that, about half of them will return to their country of origin. About half of them will end up in Canada. And Canada is a great country, so. Yeah, uh, we we are definitely uh, yes. fortunate to be in, in where we are right now. And uh, in terms of in terms of uh, now that you've touched on uh, uh, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinarity, uh, um, I, I'm wondering uh, when when constructing a research uh, group, um, you know, uh, specialization is is the name of the game in science to a certain extent. Uh, each one of us becomes extremely skilled uh, at something or another, but it is in a group environment where different skill levels and different individuals can learn from one, one another that a more complete uh, picture and a more complete project can be, can be uh, uh, moved forward. And to that extent, to how do you pay attention and how do you um, uh, move forward in, in, in constructing a group that can be uh, multidisciplinary? Um, that's a very good question, not an easy one, um, because a lot of these things happen, I wouldn't say at random, but uh, several times in my life I went to a lecture and I heard something that says, we can do photochemistry with that material. And so, for example, at the time we, I, I heard a lecture when, in the early 80s about zeolites, I thought of you, was one of the lectures that I came when I was at NRC. And before I knew, we were buying zeolites and trying to do photochemistry in zeolites. And for 10, 15 years, this was a, a big part of our uh, of our research. Um, 15 years ago, uh, we were looking at the, uh, at the I was at, at a lecture actually that they presented some initiators for for polymerization, and we thought we should be able to use these things as producing agents and we started trying to do nanomaterials and for about five six years we did a lot of we still do nanomaterials but we did nanomaterials for five six years concentrated on the materials and then uh, we ask ourselves well the reality is in nanotechnology 
the interesting thing is not the materials you make, but what you make with the materials. And so that took an aspect of a, of a health in which Emilio Alarcón was very involved in leading my group in, in that aspect, an aspect of catalysis, uh, an aspect of sensors, and, and now more oriented in some cases toward environmental issues. So I don't think we, 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 we sort of plan a roadmap of saying this is where we're going to be in five or ten years and so on, but we had a stream that, that was moving in a certain direction, and at some point we saw, hey, well, let's try this, and, and frequently we tried this and came back. But on occasion we tried something on the side and said, hey, this is really interesting. Uh, and so we, we have moved in that. And, and you, yes, science is, is the very focus and so on, but at the same time, you have to keep an open mind. And, and, and even if at some point you say, what is my research? My research is in the field of miscellaneous. Well, that's okay. Eventually will not be. Uh, so at that point, uh, open up and try something. Um, if it doesn't work or if it's a minor thing, just come back and to, to, to the, the stream or the, or, or the road you have open in front of yourself. But sometimes you take that detour, actually. And uh, at the present time, for example, we are very interested in techniques that we call single molecule spectroscopy. Uh, when I was a student, the idea that you could see one molecule sounded like crazy out of this world. Uh, gradually, it became pretty common. You could see one molecule. But now, the difference is you can see one, one molecule when that molecule is doing something. We went through a stage in which you could see the molecule, but it had to be under such strict conditions of temperature and go, that whenever you saw the molecule, it was not doing anything. It was a body molecule, yeah. actually, okay? Well, now you can see it live. It's doing things. You can see what it's doing and so on. So that I find fascinating, perhaps, because... As, as I was uh, growing up and getting into different areas, this seemed to be absolutely insane. Now, you're never going to see a molecule, let alone be a molecule doing something. Now you can do this, and so we're, we're, we're actually uh, putting a lot of effort into understanding uh, chemistry and understanding sciences one molecule at a time, actually. So. And this is really reassuring to the young scientists, the early career folks, where... Uh, you never really know where the science is going to go, and you don't need to see a hundred miles uh, in front of you. Science takes uh, these unexpected twists and turns, and okay. things change. And like you say, we didn't know that we could see active molecules uh, uh, within a reaction, but now it's the case five years later, ten years later, who knows where well, the science is. I think for, for somebody who's starting a career, you, you need to say, what can I do with what I have on hand in a reasonable time? And what is my sky-high idea that I don't know how I get there, and, and maybe it will take me many years to get there, but, but I have that goal. And so you need the two things. Because the short-term goals bring funding, bring enthusiastic students, and so on. The long-term goal it may have impact that sometimes you don't even suspect, but you know. The, the, the last thing. The, the so, last so, thing so you need, you need the, the two things, actually. Yeah, no, I, I, fully, I fully agree with that. And I, and I think with that, we are going to uh, have a short break and we'll get back on uh, part two of our interview. Thank okay, you so much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me.
What are the non-modifiable risk factors for cardiovascular disease? Cardiovascular disease can be caused by a variety of risk factors we cannot control. The older you are, the more prone you are to chronic conditions like heart disease or stroke. However, men have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease earlier in life, while women are more at risk after menopause. Women may also experience different symptoms of heart attack that may go unrecognized. You may be more at risk depending on your ethnicity. People of Asian, African, or First Nation descent have higher rates of cardiovascular disease. Your ethnicity may also influence your diet, which can put you at an increased risk for cardiovascular disease. If you have a first degree relative who has had cardiovascular disease or a stroke before the age of 55 for men and 65 for women, your risk of heart disease doubles and regular screenings with your doctor are recommended. But there is good news. Up to 80% of premature cardiovascular disease can be avoided and more effectively managed by taking these proactive steps. Quit smoking, be physically active, eat well, achieve a healthy weight, manage your stress and any anxiety or depression, and see your doctor about managing your cholesterol, blood pressure, and blood sugar levels. For more information on cardiovascular disease, please visit our website. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country. Thank you for coming back, Dr. Schiano. Uh, now in uh, part number two, uh, I want to start by maybe refocusing on the main research effort uh, and the main research topic that you uh, spearheaded from 40 years ago, uh, which is photochemistry. Now that is not, that is not a, a term that is wildly understood. I think some uh, might remember early biology and photosynthesis. Mm -hmm. Now. Uh, from there, I'll, I'll, I'll give the floor to you to explain to us a little bit more about photochemistry and, and, the, way, and the way it is. Well, maybe we cut the word in half. And so uh, chemistry, of course, is used in synthesis, in pharma, in a lot of areas. And a lot of the chemistry, traditional chemistry, the source of energy is heat. You, you boil or reflux or do things using heat to drive chemistry. Well, another form of energy is, is light. And photochemistry is basically chemistry where the source of energy, the external source of energy, is light. And, of course, photosynthesis is, a, is an excellent uh, natural example. Um, another example of photochemistry is sunburn. So if you go into the sun for, for, for too long, photochemistry is very efficient and, and you may eventually regret it. And so... Um, Sometimes some of the things we do in photochemistry are promoting chemistry that is done with light, and, uh, and some of the things we do in photochemistry is uh, not promoting but preventing 
And so we, some of our areas of research include sunscreens, where, where our photochemistry is, is, well, let's do something that absorbs the light and doesn't do much. Okay, so we, we go the whole extreme the, the, from, from preventing the effect of light to using light to advantage to either uh, make chemicals, clean water, produce hydrogen, and so on. So, so yeah. light is our source of energy, and the, the cheapest one we have is the sun. It's not always the most convenient, by the way, but, but it's definitely the one that, the, that is the, the cheapest one we have. That, that, that is very interesting, and it's true. And I, and I believe from my limited uh, knowledge uh, in the field is that photochemistry, uh, using, using light as an energy source, is in fact uh, allows us to, to, pro uh, to, to basically do extremely fast reactions and, 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 and promote extremely fast reactions that maybe are limited within a, or do not occur in a, in a heat uh, source environment. The photochemistry allows us to do reactions that are fast, but the, the two things that, that we uh, that do photochemistry always advertise is that we have temporal and spatial control. And what does that mean? Temporal means if I'm doing something with light, I have the ability to switch the light on and off. And therefore, I can actually make it go, make it stop. Uh, spatial means I can aim the light, like you do with a flashlight, and say, I, this is the area where I, I want the chemistry to occur. And of course, uh, when I talk about the flashlight, I'm talking at the, about the relatively large area, the same if I talk about the lamp or, or, or these days, LEDs. But also, these technologies are used in extremely small dimensions, and all the patterns that makes the chips in our computers and iPhones and things like that, they're all made with light. That's and the, they the take advantage. The, yeah, takes advantage that we, we know when and where we can deliver the light. That so. that that is that is definitely the case. And I believe that and I believe that basically uh, using being able to harness the, the energy of light in a lab in a lab environment uh, is is definitely a, a very interesting and unique uh, uh, aspect of, of, of research and, 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 uh, and uh, production and development. And uh, to that extent, I would, I would ask you, um, be, being so um, uh, prominent in the field, how do you see the photochemistry research uh, developing or developed over uh, the past few decades here locally in Canada and maybe even internationally? How do you see that? Um. A lot of photochemistry principles, basic concepts and things like that, were developed between the 60s and the 80s, okay? Uh, and some of my colleagues may object to this statement that, you know, things are, new things are happening in photochemistry. Uh, yes, but few. The vast majority of it happening in photochemistry is that those concepts over the last 20 years were used in what I like to call applied photochemistry. We're not necessarily developing new concepts, but we are using the concepts that are already in place to do incredible things in terms of organic chemistry. For example, I mean, there is a technique which is called photoredox catalysis that is very prominent among organic chemists these days. And the things that are done are just amazing. But the individual con concepts, if you divide the things that have been done. Those concepts have been around for quite some time. And so most of what is happening in photochemistry is applications of photochemistry concepts to, to, to environment, to synthesis, to pharma, and things like that. Uh, one thing that has happened over the last 10, 20 years, uh, 10 years mostly, is the development of new light sources based on LEDs. So now anybody can actually have a light source that is of the kind of energy, the color, that you really need for your chemistry. Before this, it requires people with more knowledge of optics and, and more equipment and so on. Now it's become easy and inexpensive as well. Okay? So the, the developments have largely been what I call applied photochemistry, which is take the concepts that are there and use them for 
extremely smart things actually the, the things that the people are doing are just so incredible. The technology finally caught up and and is able to uh, move forward the the actual like physics laws of uh, that existed and were understood uh, years ago and now the technologies are just uh, uh, providing new applications you, of you, these. Right? You no longer need to be a specialist to use photochemistry or to do things using photochemistry using light. Anybody in, in, in organic and biological fields and so on can use it with, with, of course, some knowledge of the field, but without being a specialist in that field. And that's really, and again, we're bringing it back to the idea of early science research and early, and early career professionals. It's really good to democratize the ability mm -hmm. to utilize science and, and to lower the threshold of uh, entry into, into research. And uh, to that extent, the, the, the technologies that are now uh, developed in photochemistry do allow for uh, the integration of, of, uh, of research from an early stage. And an early Absolutely. Stage. And yeah. we, we, need to, we need to provide easy access to, to, to young uh, scientists. Uh, uh, I see in this area, I see over there a book that I co-authored, and I can tell you it's 1,100 pages. Okay? <laughs> the people who actually want to use photochemistry as a tool to, without becoming a specialist, need something which is an, an easier read, something that you can do on a few hours and say, well, let me give you the initial background and then I'll move on from there, actually. And so I'm hoping to actually help in that particular area with providing something that says, well, we got an 1,100-page book for you, but if you are not ready for that, we'll give you some tools that they give you faster a faster start. That's that, amazing. Actually, that, so. that, that that's amazing, and that is part of how you are uh, be, how you are able to to spread and 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 elevate the research across the board from from the early stages all the way to the most applied and most uh, sophisticated versions of that. And now I want to you know speaking of being able to democratize science and democratize research and be able to spread it. Uh, uh, everywhere. I want to highlight your efforts in the International Development Research Center, which is this international collaboration that that has uh, not that doesn't only include Canada but also uh, uh, partners from South Africa and especially Kenya. And uh, and and your work and your and your group's work in terms of uh, looking at how, ways to clean water. I think this is this is uh, extremely important in this day and age, especially with the environmental effects that we have and the climate change that we're facing. So I want you to exp like maybe let us understand how did this how did this idea become uh, a, a new a new uh, purpose of yours? About three years ago, IDRC, the International Development Research Center, uh, made a call for proposals um, in projects that could help uh, certain countries in, in, in Africa. Um, and we applied, we, we found a partner in South Africa, and then with the, with the help of the, our South African friends, we identified the, the Kenya as a place where we could actually help partners in Kenya. We applied. Um, we were successful and, and happy for that because it turned out to be a very tough competition. They, we thought there would be very few applicants. It's, it's surprising how many applicants that were interested in this. So uh, ours was uh, Kenya-centered. They funded two. The other one was Uganda-centered and was, uh, was won by Magil. Okay, right. so we are right now at the, right about the middle point of a five-year project. Um, Kenya and Canada are funded by Canada. South Africa is kind of self-funded, but they're part of the same project. Um, and the idea is to um, help provide uh, drinking water uh, by using uh, sunlight as a way to, let's say, purify or clean water. Uh, Kenya, incidentally, has lots of water. What they have is a water quality problem, not a water quantity problem, okay, which is it's an area that we couldn't help with water quantity, but with qualities that we're trying to help. And so we're trying to develop uh, catalysts, st structures that will absorb light 
and do two things. Uh, one is uh, kill bacteria, and the other one is uh, reduce the uh, the organic contaminants that uh, that they have in Kenya. We have them in Canada too, by the way. Okay, that is a, gr a wide variety of contaminants and and uh, things like uh, ibuprofen and estrogens are mm. in in any place where it has a, a large population nearby. And so these are things that we're we're trying to do with sunlight. Um, a catalyst is a molecule that assists in in doing this and Right now, um, we know how to do it, but uh, the problem is that, you know, to do, to clean water, the water has to be cleaned in a flow system. We know if you, we have catalysts that are powders and will kill bacteria, will eliminate organic matter, but then at the end you have to get rid of this powder, okay? Sure. So, the stage at which we are now is, we kind of know how to do it. But we have to do it with technologies that allow water to flow and the catalyst to stay behind to keep doing the job. And so one of the things that we have published recently is uh, take the, the, the active catalysts that do the job and support them in glass wool. The same glass wool that you use for insulation in the houses. Mm. And so you can flow water over glass wool. The glass wool doesn't flow. The water flows. And so we're trying to make this technology now available and so on. Um, a side part of this project, and, and one that we would like to exploit eventually, is that we have found that in the, in the process of destroying organic contaminants, we can actually use the organic contaminants to generate hydrogen. And so this is at the present time a sort of a hope for the future. But we know we can take ibuprofen eliminate the ibuprofen and, and, and get hydrogen bubbling from the system at the same time with the same catalyst. So this is something that uh, is not a specific goal of a, of this particular project. The project is to provide clean water, uh, but it is a, a goal for us as a group in the future, say, can we use the contaminants in the Ottawa River, which are not many, by the way, uh, compared with other locations, and actually make Hydrogen in the process of, for example, eliminating estrogens from the, from the Ottawa River. Right. So, uh, and by the way, this is kind of Kenya-centered, um, but this is not a Kenya problem. This is a worldwide problem, water quality, okay? So, uh, what, I was going to say, we definitely have a, a water quality and, and availability issue even here in Canada. Yes, we do in the uh, north, actually. That is, that and, is and, sort of a, and occasionally in other communities. So. These are technologies that, that uh, are not centered on, on, on Kenya, but even if our, goal, our primary goal is Kenya, uh, but, but they could be used in many other places in the world. Yes. Incidentally, we are, we are helping the, the universities in Nairobi with the, the, the organization of master programs and things like that. And, uh, uh, I've been in, in, in Kenya teaching courses and so on. We have had my own students in both Kenya and South Africa. We have had students from Kenya and South Africa in our labs in Ottawa. That's so fantastic. Uh, part of uh, the diversity that we mentioned before, I mean, includes these guests. That, from, uh, that, that, from is the, that is absolutely correct. That is absolutely correct. And the idea here is that you got, uh, there, there is this need to uh, 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 meet the difficulties that the world is facing mm -hmm. in terms of availability of clean, drinkable water. Like you say, it, it's sometimes not a question of, of quantity, but quality. Absolutely. We here in Canada have the quantities with the rivers and the lakes and all of that, but the quality is a, is a, is a matter of, of concern. And the same would be in some of the uh, areas around the world. S some of the countries in Africa do have the problems quantity. of water quantity, but the, the countries which include Uganda and, and Kenya that are around Lake Victoria, which is the largest lake in, in, uh, in Africa, uh, they have available water. I mean, there's plenty of water available, but quality as it reaches cities is a different story. And, and, so and, we, and that would be where you can actually create uh, uh, producers of clean water uh, and that will then be able to distribute that yes. water to, to, to the folks that have uh, a quantity yeah. problem as opposed to a, a quality yeah. 
uh, problem. And and uh, uh, where do you see? Uh, where, you know, you said this is a you're halfway through a five year program, but where do you? How do you see this type of this type of technology and this type of uh, 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 international collaboration uh, move forward? Forward, uh, and how how would you see it spread? Uh, because I believe that this is maybe the ultimate goal. Um, the areas where we really, I think, we are going to solve this problem in the lab, okay, with including flow systems and so on, but the uh, uh, scale up, scale up most from the lab to, to engineering. And if you're going to, to provide clean water to communities and so on, uh, scale up, scale up in the context of very robust technologies and things like that is, uh, is absolutely critical. Okay? Um, the fact that we can do it in a bottle or small volumes and so on um, is a great way of demonstrating the principle that this can be done and so on. But then when we need to bring it up to, to, to large volumes and so on. And, and that's one of the reasons that we're, for example, very enthusiastic about the, the use of glass wool. Because glass wool is something that scale up is not an issue. You know, we probably have uh, many, many kilograms of glass wool in, in our homes as part of insulation. It's very inexpensive. We are not using any special glass wool. Uh, except for characterization, but you know, the, because we want to know exactly what we have. Um, but other than that, is the regular glass wool. So, so this is, is, I think, the way to 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 go with with simple things, um, with elements, and we use, for example, titanium, uh, with elements that are abundant on Earth, both because of a, of price and because uh, just as we have endangered species. In other areas, well, we do have endangered elements in the periodic table, and if we can stay away from those elements, um, it would be great, actually. So we want things that can be scaled up from the point of view of technology, also from the point of view of what we are using in, in the lab. It's great so. to be able to, from the, from the science research stage, to already think about how to bridge it into the next stage, the scalability, yes. the industry, and so, and and we all know in science that collaborations don't only happen between lab to lab, but also lab to industry, Absolutely. lab lab to uh, collaborations that Absolutely. we can scale up and 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 make and make whatever happens in the lab be available to a much wider uh, uh, population. So now that we're coming to a close in this interview, I'd like to ask like a, a one final question uh, uh, from somebody uh, that has seen it all across the world i i would i what what kind of advice would you give to young early career scientists and academics to maybe give them a hint as to where to how to shape their their uh career trajectory well i, I think it's important to actually choose topics that are based on on on, on fundamental principles but combine them with things that they, that they look at reality uh, in the context of what are today's problems. And if we look at today's problems, there are problems related with health, there are problems related with water quality, which is connected to that. We have problems of, of energy, both of how much energy we have. How do we produce it? And so can we find sources that do not produce CO2, for example? Can we use... Uh, contaminated water to make fuel. And so I think that looking at, at things that, that really impact society combined with that very fundamental knowledge is, is really the, the path to go, actually. And also in the context of uh, sometimes uh, attracting students to, to our labs, I think you'll find that those projects that, uh, that have societal impact are actually the ones who, who bring the young people into our labs. That's excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Skiano, for coming to Thank us. Thank you for having me. Much appreciated. Beats Radio, scientists interviewing scientists. Canada is a worldwide leader in science and innovation. However, our communities need to be more connected to current scientific research in order to drive the future of scientific innovation. So what steps can we take to more actively engage and connect our community with scientists and vice versa? 
Innovation and discovery are at the core of the current efforts of our government, but science sometimes gets slightly complicated to understand. At Beats Radio, we will tackle this by having young scientists and early career researchers interviewing scientists and innovators. By dissecting science in simple terms, this will allow our community to better understand the importance of science for our country.